yeah, so I hit the record button and uh, sorry for my background. I thought that I can blare it out, but my Zoom is not cooperating. And actually, you know, trouble. yeah, the, the room was occupied, so I had to do, do it from the kitchen. And maybe I have to change places during the, uh, the, the, the meeting, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity. I'm busy the next week, probably, and I, didn't, and I know that you had a very packed schedule, so I didn't want to miss this chance to talk to you. And thanks. Yeah, for I'm, I'm glad we were able to, to make it work. Yeah, thank you. Always fun to talk. Yeah. So uh, today we have Daniel Wiseman on, and you might know him as Steak and Iron on Twitter. And he has he makes very funny comments. That's the part that I <laughs> like very much. And today we're gonna get deeper into his mind, and not only about nutrition. And it was his own suggestion to get into more of his ideas. And I'm pretty, I'm really looking forward to that. So Daniel, let's start with the nutrition and we will get to the other, uh, other areas, other subjects you're interested in. Uh, first of all, for those who may not, uh, may not know you, please give a background story of how you became interested in eating the way you do and living the way you do sure sure so um in my youth i um never really had to worry too much about nutrition um and then i went off to college and i moved out of my parents home at a fairly young age for for where i live i live in silicon valley california which is very expensive very difficult place to live by really any measure but i moved out um, without a college degree still going to college working full-time at the same time, and that left very little time for um, sort of any kind of self-care. You know, I did not exercise. I had very little money for food. I was uh, eating whatever was on sale uh, or honestly, we things that were thrown away. I worked with, um, I was friends with a person who ran a coffee shop and all the pastries and things that got thrown out at the end of the day, I just got them in a garbage bag. And I had a uh, part of, you know, the, the amount of calories that I consumed. And uh, I survived, uh, you know, I, I made it through, I got my degree, uh, but when I did, um, I became very aware that I was in my mid-20s and I had a body that was not acting the way that I think somebody of my age should be acting. Uh, you know, I was in constant pain, neck pain, back pain, foot pain, um, I got nosebleeds uh, fairly often, um, I had very, very low energy um, I had trouble with things like falling asleep while driving. Um, I very nearly died several times. Um, I got developed uh, nerve pain in my feet and hands. It even continues to this day. Uh, I, get, I developed cataracts in my eyes. I have artificial lenses in both eyes. I was one of the youngest people in California to get a procedure uh, that was only recently approved to fix that. Um, you know, there, a lot of stuff was going wrong that happened to a lot of people, but they were happening to me in my 20s. And I just, I thought, ah, this isn't right. I need to fix something. And it was clear that I was unhealthy. So I also looked unhealthy. I was, you know, probably at my peak, uh, you know, about uh, 250 pounds, which is 115 or so kilos, um, and uh, five foot nine. Um, so I, I didn't wear it well. It was all in my stomach. I had, you know, big round belly, which is uh, not healthy. And um, I just decided to try anything that I could. You know, I tried doing calorie counting and you know around here one of the common things you could find were like these hundred calorie packs of snacks you know these little teeny tiny bags of chips or cookies or whatever so you can portion things out and i tried that and it's like okay if you actually eat low enough calories you do lose weight but you're hungry and you're tired and i was already always hungry and tired and all i was doing was making the problem worse um we're also kind of getting into the time i'm 36 now so this was in the early say 2000 uh, 2000 2006, 2005, 2006 time, things like gluten-free were becoming um, popular. Things like plant-based, vegan, uh, vegetarianism, those were really sort of coming online as like ways to be healthy. So I tried those, um, you know, and, you know, substituting, say, your uh, wheat flour with black beans or things like that. Um, and I didn't really notice anything changing, really. And I just, I didn't feel better. I started exercising. I 
my it looked up like okay, how do I how do I look better too? Because I didn't like the way I looked. I didn't like the way I feel, but I didn't really like the way I looked either. I figured those are kind of related problems, right? So I started lifting weights, but I was just so tired. Like I'd get halfway through the workout as prescribed online. Like, you know, they have guides and you, you lift this much, this many times. And then the next time you do it differently this way. And I'd go to these guides. I couldn't complete half of it. I'd just be, I'd, my arms, I couldn't lift my arms. I could barely stumble back to the car afterwards. And then I'm online and I see this thing called keto on uh, one of the message boards. And I talk about this ketogenic diet. And one of the things that was popular a few years before uh, I went on this you know, little branch of my, my health journey was Atkins. And I don't know if, if Atkins is a global thing or it's more of an American thing, you know, but you know, it's a low carbohydrate thing. So you don't eat sugar, you don't eat grains, you don't eat fruit. Um, you just eat, you know, meat and vegetables and, and that kind of stuff and drink Diet Coke. And I was like, okay, this sounds like that Atkins thing. And I remember, I, I remember hearing a lot of people seem to do it and it seemed to work. They lost some weight. And I don't know if it's really healthy to do a long time because, I mean, this is, like I said, 2005. You don't really have the same access to all of the same medical information you do now. Um, actually, by now, this is a little bit later. This is more like 2010. Um, so am I going to kill myself doing this? Am I going to get a heart attack? In my 20s, probably not. Um, so I'll just try it and see what happens. And if I die, maybe I'll leave a good-looking body uh, for, the, you know, for the ceremony, uh, funeral. So I decided to give it a shot. And... Uh, really just kind of clicked instantly. Um, I mean, within the first month, I was down 15 pounds. Um, my energy levels were up. I was sleeping better. Um, things like, uh, you know, uh, my, I had a very long commute. I you know, had to commute over an hour each direction. No issues, you know, in, in the evenings driving home, being sleepy. Um, and I just kind of sat back and I went, wait a minute, what? You know, everything I'd run up, up to this point is, okay, you need – you gotta you need to eat your protein of some kind to get muscle, and you gotta have your fat because otherwise you can't absorb your vitamins or you know certain chem or make certain hormones or whatever. You can't go zero fat, but don't eat too much fat because it's bad for you. And then you have to have your carbs for your energy. And you know a lot of people they get like you know, the keto flu or whatever when they go low. Really had a, a taste for salt. Like I always really liked salty things, pickles and uh, olives and that kind of stuff. So I never really went through that part. Just I I, I instantly had this burst of energy and it just this was the first time i'd really tried something as a self-experiment that was completely opposite everything i'd ever heard before and it worked beautifully and instantly you know it wasn't like one of these things like, oh you gotta stick with it for six months and then maybe no instantly so i said huh what else don't i know right so i kind of started going down this rabbit hole of, of different uh nutritional paths um and learning about uh, different ways to do these, these kind of diets. Why do they work? Um, is this um, a, a novel biohack or is this actually maybe something more in line with our own evolutionary path? You know, it's my belief that we've, you know, we, we evolved over billions of years to be here. And does this fit the, the evidence that we have of more or less what we were eating up until uh, relatively recently? And I think it does. You know, we didn't have Oreos, you know, growing on trees, you know, when we were, you know, uh, you know, hiding in caves from, from thunderstorms, right? So I've tried, you know, the, the high meat versions of the diet, and that seems to work very, very well for me. Uh, I tried the high plant uh, versions of a low-carbohydrate diet, did not really work so well for me. Um, I've tried very much whole foods-based versions of a low-carbohydrate diet. Um, but my first, you know, attempts at it were, you know, a lot of junk food-based, uh, and it still worked. You know, the, the, the keto cheesecakes and cookies and breads and stuff. Stone, uh, away from you know a highly processed food diet into something that's maybe more appropriate um, and sustainable. But even then, you know, I'm e eating mayonnaise and cream cheese and, and processed stuff, but reducing the, the carbs and the sugar content, I still had those very quick results. And it just really kind of impressed me. And even every, uh, you know, objective and subjective measure of my health that I could think of improved you know i got strong very quickly i uh, i uh my you know my waist diameter went down very quickly um all of this sort of you know, mood issues skin issues um pain issues um i didn't have health insurance at the time but, but my nosebleeds and, and uh, stuff would indicate to me that i had very very high blood pressure but by the time um you know i'd, I'd gotten my job and got my insurance and everything and got my physicals and whatnot i'd already been doing this for a while and my blood pressure is ideal my, you know, even by the standard measures of blood cholesterol, even though I'm eating 
you know, two or three dozen eggs a week, two or three sticks of butter a week. My cholesterol is perfect. Whereas I kind of, I doubt it probably was when I was obese. So, um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of, um, other belief systems that I've arrived at where the, the, the core assumption was that I don't know everything. Let's talk to people who have different perspectives and consider them, you know, entertain these ideas. What if I'm wrong? And doing that has really worked out really, really well for me. And it's also given me this perspective of just absolutely laughing at people who say, oh, I know everything. I've got all the answers. Let me tell you how you need to do things. And I go, no, 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 no. That's not how this works. You, you don't know everything anything you may know a couple of things that have worked well for you but you have you don't even know if what you're doing is best for yourself you can't tell me what's best for me so um that results in kind of you know my 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 personality as it exists now uh, on twitter you know i laugh at people i crack jokes but i've always thought humor was a powerful tool uh, in general i mean you still remember jokes that your, your parents told you when you were a kid right you know 20 30 years back you, your dad tells you some funny joke you still remember it because humor sticks with you and you know, i'm not a researcher i'm not a doctor I, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm, you know, I've got an engineering degree. I work in sales and, um, I just have always found that, that humor is a way to make points stand out, you know, under on a big cloud of data, you say, what does all this mean? And if you can say something that's memorable and funny, you, you can kind of drill down into it and you go, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I can see what you mean by that. That's why people like, you know, you're, I don't know, depending on what you, how you feel about him, I don't know. I think he's a bit of a clown, but you know, Joe Rogan, you know, says a lot of stuff, really funny stuff. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong, but you remember it. And so, you know, that's sort of how I, I, I do what I do, and that brings me to today. And I've got this, you know, level of health and, and vitality that I wish I had 10 years ago, but it's gotten me a life that is, is, is good. You know, I was able to have enough energy and focus to get a, a better job, you know, meet a wonderful woman, get married, have a kid. And I just don't see the person that was you know, me 10 years ago, or, you know, even longer than that now, um, but, you know, last decade, being able to be in the lifestyle I have now, I would not have done it if I did not already, you know, wrap my car around a tree by falling asleep at the wheel. So that's me. Yeah, that's a powerful story. And uh, actually scary mm -hmm. at times, the uh, part that you told about your falling asleep behind the wheel, and that. Yep. As you said, it, it could have literally killed you. And the mistakes that we make because we are only low in energy every day, every, uh, some of them, not every one of them, some of them have the potential to really kill us. And there are so many questions that uh, came, came up uh, in my mind. And let's start with this one that you said that you had a friend that gave you free food from the coffee shop. Uh, yeah, I I am so interested to know how did your teeth look like then? Um, well, you know I've I always had good habits with my teeth. Uh, you know that was one of those one of the things that my parents were very you know strict about, making sure that I always brush my teeth uh, twice a day. Um, so I lucked out pretty good, but um, you know even then, um, after after that point, um, I didn't have you know, any kind of dental insurance for a good long while. I actually went 11 years without going to the dentist. And you know, in the middle of that, I went low carb. And, you know, once I got back to the dentist, they said, oh, your, your teeth are perfect. Okay, great. And then, you know, uh, for example, with the, you know, uh, the COVID shutdown and stuff here, there was a year or almost two years between dentist visits. And I'll just be frank, you know, I, I was not brushing my teeth, you know, every day I've got the kid and I've got all the, the work and everything else. It's very busy. And yeah, maybe I brush my teeth every other day but I was not eating any sugar. I still managed to keep my diet in line, but um, the dentist was like, oh yeah, your, your teeth are perfect. You must have been taking great care of them during you know, the, the COVID shutdown. I was like, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Every day, brush and floss twice a day. Um, but I thought that was also pretty interesting is that uh, I, apparently there had been a bit of a, a dental um, like apocalypse, uh, according to my dentist, <laughs> for the last couple of years of people just sort of depression eating Oreos and drinking soda and, and you know, alcohol and not, brushing their teeth and you're know, just kind of, you know, burying themselves under blankets, watching movies uh, and not, you know, practicing the kind of self-care that you should have. But um, yeah, I managed to avoid that. And I think that probably not eating the sugar, it has at least something to do with that. But, you know, before that, yeah, I just, maybe you can't outrun a bad diet, but maybe you can outbrush a bad diet. I don't know. It worked out. Yeah, that has uh, for sure worked out for you, but I wasn't that lucky in that respect. 
I mean, for after a year, almost a year of vegetarianism, I uh, I damaged one of my teeth so badly, and I had to. What is it called? This procedure that they kill the nerves in the in the teeth. root canal. Yeah, yeah, root canal. I had to do that. And now here's something. Here's something interesting. Here's something interesting that I'm going to talk about. You know, my brother and I grew up in the same house, and you know we're related, as far as I know. Right? I don't think we found him on the doorstep, but he always had tooth problems. And I'm also thinking back when he was a kid. He was a very very picky eater, and he didn't. Uh, he basically lived on pasta, whereas I ate everything. And kind of learning what I'd, I've learned from like the Weston A. Price Foundation about dental health, you know, as you go through childhood and through puberty, it makes me wonder, did that have something to do with not just a deterioration of the teeth, but a, a prevention of the teeth from developing to be as strong as they could have been if he was eating better? I don't know. But I mean, we both brush our teeth the same amount as we always did growing up. I don't know what he does now, but... I just thought that was kind of interesting. My brother always, my brother always at the dentist. He's got cavities and everything else. I'm not sure he's got any of his own teeth left, and I do. So maybe there's something to that. Yeah. And uh, right now, how do you eat? Are your percentages keto? You really try to hit that keto percentage, seventy-five percent of fat or so. Or I I used to be really keen on the percentages and counting of things. And that was more like when I was in a, say a transitional phase, moving toward a certain level of health. I am at a level of health right now where I am comfortable and I don't want to introduce more complication into my day. So generally I just don't eat things with any significant level of carbohydrate content in them. Um, so most of my diet is meat. Um, you know, I like chicken, eggs, uh, fish, uh, red meat, uh, you know, steak, burgers, um, uh, pork chops, pork shoulders, all that kind of stuff. And, but I don't really necessarily, I mean, I prefer fattier cuts, um, but I basically, you know, with, with having a kid, I buy what's on sale. Um, and then there's a few vegetables I enjoy. I cook those, some nuts, you know, fattier nuts, walnuts and, and pecans and almonds every so often. Those are more of a treat. Some dairy. Uh, I find dairy tends to make me more hungry, so I've been avoiding it lately. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I don't count anything. I think that an ideal diet for a person should be one that doesn't require as much maintenance. That your body should give you some level of feedback on, and that may not be immediate. I know I talk I, I, you know, I've talked to people online who are you know 400, 500 pounds, and I think at that point the, the whole feedback mechanism is is shot, and you need to have um, you know you need to bring yourself back to metabolic health. Uh, before you can necessarily trust your body's signals. But um, once you're sort of at a baseline, I don't think you should have to track. You know, I don't think that your diet should be making you hungry. You know, we, we're complicated. We're complex machines. And there are feedback mechanisms that prevent you from, say, drinking too much water. I mean, nobody, nobody goes to the, you know, we got infinite clean water, um, at least here. I don't know about Poland, uh, but in uh, here we've got infinite clean water. Nobody's drowning themselves in, in you know, drinking fountains. You know, or just, you know, getting gallons of water and just, you know, drinking themselves until they get the, you know, sodium deficiency and put themselves in the hospital. It doesn't happen unless, you know, barring you know, mental illness or anything like that. But people still eat themselves into obesity and levels of obesity where they, you know, can't get out of bed. So those feedback mechanisms are, are broken, but other ones aren't. I think once you're at the health, you can trust your body to an extent. And I think that that's, you know, mine looks like a lot of meat vegetables other people's is a little bit different but um that's why i encourage people to try different methods there are people who are on a vegan version of keto there are people who are strict carnivore there are people who literally eat nothing but beef water and salt and that's what works for them i think that's extremely boring um i've tried it i've done it it works great i feel good on it i get bored i like food um but yeah that's why i talk about just doing self-experimentation find something that works deviate from that if it works better keep doing that if it doesn't work, come back to what was working in the first place. Yeah, it makes sense. And you mentioned dairy. Uh, what kinds of dairy did you consume? And now you're not consuming any dairy. I, I try to minimize it. I wouldn't say I'm avoiding it. Well, I'm avoiding it unless it's put in front of me. I'll say it that way. Um, it's for, for me, dairy in my, my household is largely going to be cheeses. I live in California, so we have 
really good dairy products here. We're one of the few places in the United States where you're allowed to sell um, what we'd call a cottage industry uh, dairy. So like somebody who just has a small farm, um, they will you know make cheese and sell it at the local markets. You can have raw dairy, unpasteurized dairy here, um, which is pretty unusual. I know it's in most places outside the United States, it's not uncommon, but in the United States, it's actually very uncommon. And California allows it. So uh, I have access to very, very high quality cheeses and I do like them a lot, but you know, I've gone back and forth. I've done a number of these experiments and every single time if I cut out the dairy, I just don't get hungry at all. Like I, I'll go through my whole day and not even think about food and, you know, dinner time will roll around. I go, well, time to make dinner. But if I have, you know, say cheese the day before, I'll, I'll have this like little voice in the back of my head goes, Hey, there's some more cheese in the fridge. The cheese doesn't have any carbs in it. You could have as much cheese as you want. And <laughs> still that voice to shut up sometimes. But other times, you know, just a bit like, well, well, I guess I'm just eating a pound of cheese today. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, that's another thing that I didn't want to admit because I really, really do like cheese. But there does seem to be something to it. And other people have noticed this too. Um, and it just ah, it pisses me off because I love cheese so much. But I have to admit there's something there. Yeah, I have a very similar experience with dairy in general and also very, yeah. very similar experience with uh, cheese in particular that, yeah, yeah, it always calls me to itself. And probably, <laughs> I think I heard it from Dr. Tro uh, that he once mentioned that because dairy is a kind of food for the animal baby to make it mm-hmm. willing to eat more. And mm-hmm. because of that, it has that effect. Even the processed form, I mean, considering how much uh, you how much change you consider processing the processing that turns it into cheese probably preserves those characteristics that makes mm-hmm. it still so palatable and make makes us yeah. eat more and yeah. that makes sense i mean that's what nature created dairy is a very interesting food to make animals grow and i think if you're trying to grow let's say you're a weightlifter or something you're trying to gain muscle might be something very good for you um, if you're not trying to grow, it may be something worth cutting out. And um, I mean, I've, I've tried, you know, people say, oh, try raw dairy and try this kind of dairy, try fermented, try yogurt. I don't see any difference between any of it. It all has the same effect on me. Um, and I uh, got that annoys me. <laughs> I, just, I don't want to be raw. I don't want to be right about it because it, it's just my life feels like it's better with cheese in it. But if I'm trying to be let's say, as healthy as I am, uh, I want to be or if I say I'm coming back from um, you know, I'm not religious about my diet. You know, if, I, if there's a birthday or if there's a holiday or if I'm on vacation or something, yeah, I'll enjoy some regional delicacies or something special um, and then come back to the base diet. But you know, if I bloat up a little bit on that, I need to say, okay, I'm going to get everything back to my baseline. I got to give up the dairy for at least a little bit and let everything settle back uh, so my clothes fit better. Um, and it's just, ah, I just hate it. <laughs> I just absolutely hate it. I wish I was wrong about it, but I, I just, I don't seem to be, I've tried everything else. I've tried, is it nuts? No, it's not nuts. Is it, uh, is it processed meat? Is it salt? Is it, no, it's the, the damn cheese. Uh, I get, I get you. Uh, you said that you're not very religious about your diet and it reminded me of uh, a, po- a point you raised in your interview with Dr. Baker. Uh, yeah. The way you look at quote unquote cheat meal how do you view that? Because that I found very interesting and I would like yeah. you to repeat it here, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how active you or your listeners are necessarily in, say, the uh, keto communities or whatever online, but there's this fear of being kicked out of ketosis if you have this, um, you know, uh, like a higher carbohydrate treat. I was just talking to somebody who accidentally took a sip of iced tea that was sweetened and they were freaking out about it. And I said, Look, calm down, you're okay. You know, an entire mouthful of Coca-Cola is like five grams of sugar. If you took a big slug of this tea, you're not even anywhere near that. But um, I look at food as not as more than just fuel. fuel. Food is enjoyable and it should be. But there are foods that behave very much like drugs. Okay. I think that you can look, look at an Oreo. There's no nutrition in it, but it's, you can put it into your body and it has an effect. To me, if, if it's not sustaining you if it's not providing you with nutrition it is a drug and that's okay i'm not even anti-drug i just think if you're going to be putting something into your body you need to understand what the effects are of it and to make a judgment call put it on the scale say is is the good going to outweigh the bad if so go for it rock and roll uh, and that's how i view the the cheat meal i don't like cheat meal because if i was cheating on a diet if you say if you're cheating at chess or something you're bending the rules 
to give yourself an unfair advantage. Cheating on your diet would be like you know taking amphetamines. That's cheating on your diet. You take amphetamines so you don't eat for a month. Guarantee you lose weight, and that, but that's that's cheating, right? But they say a cheat meal. I say don't do a cheat meal. Do a treat meal, and a treat meal is something that is special. So you know, some people say, oh, every two weeks you have a pop tart or whatever, and I'm like, that seems kind of silly, right? I mean, the pop tarts. They're always there. They're on the they're on the shelves. They're they're not made with love. They're not, you know. There's nothing special about them. And that, that's something that, you know, growing up, I loved sandwich cookies. I loved the Oreos. I loved. Uh, we had these El fudges, which were like a chocolate sandwich cookie. And I think everybody has some kind of relationship with a sandwich cookie. And that would be my sort of indulgence if, uh, you know, if I ever had like a bad day or whatever. And in fact, you know, I had a, a period after um, finding health where things kind of went all to hell. And I, uh, you know, I, I went down the rabbit hole of the uh, the sandwich cookie and ice cream again, and I gained quite a bit of weight back. Um, and the realization hit me is that, you know, I've lived through, you know, maybe not as much as, as as other people, but I mean, there's been some some big global events in my lifetime. You know, we had, you know, global recessions, and we had COVID, and we had uh, which is the uh, you know 9/11, and we had uh, you know all these, all these these terrorist attacks, and we had these shortages and we had the, the stock market crashes and everything else. But you know what? Oreos are always on the shelf and they're always going to be on the shelf because they're made by a robot a thousand miles away. And there's this, if you really, if the, if the path to your happiness is actually going to run through a $3 box of cookies on the shelf at the store down the street, if, that's, if you really think about it, and that is really the last thing keeping you from being happy. Just go get it. Your life is perfect already. What do you What do you even care about your health at this point? Your life is perfect. You got all you need is one more box of cookies, and you're going to be perfectly happy. Go get it. But to me, I look at it and say, there's probably something else I should do. And if there's something that is special, you know, for example, for my wife's birthday a couple of years ago, we were in Las Vegas, and there's a very very good restaurant there called the Momofuku, and um, I think it's David Chang's restaurant. And we got this amazing, like, 10-course meal, and it had, yeah, it had rice and, and cake and all this other kind of stuff that came with it. And we had these uh, uh, craft cocktails that had sugar uh, in them as well, and it was a phenomenal meal. And it was worth it because I don't – I'm never going to have a chance – well, I won't say never, but I don't have a chance to do that every day. I can go get Oreos every day. I can't have a meal at the Momofuku every day. I can't have, you know, for example, I, my grandma's apple pie. Or whatever. Um, I can't have you know some regional treat maybe while I'm on vacation. You know, I I, I get to travel a bit, so there's certain things that I just can't get locally. Okay, and I'll, I'll look at it and say oh, if it looks good enough, yeah, let's try it. Uh, at least try a little bit. Oh, did I lose you? Yeah, no, no, you haven't lost me. Just a moment. Let me open the door. <laughs> Someone rang the bell. Uh, sorry, they are checking the gas apparently. <laughs> yeah. So you said that you're not necessarily anti-drug, and it reminds me of uh, one of your tweets, which was rather recent. You said if you don't believe you should have completely legal recreational cocaine, you've fallen victim to the pro propaganda for the war on drugs. Could you elaborate yep. on that? Uh, do you mean it? And if you mean it to I, what extent? Okay. I, I do. And one of my, um, I, I'll just, I'll preface it by saying, yes, I realize this is a very controversial statement. And no, I am not advocating anybody listening to this podcast do cocaine. I don't think it's a good idea. But what I, for one thing, you own your body and you, you get to decide what to do with it. I mean, it doesn't matter where you are in this world. You probably can go find somebody to buy cocaine from right now and try it. Probably can. There's probably somebody within a mile of you right now selling cocaine. But you don't. You don't even go look for it. Why not? People seem to like the stuff, but you don't do it. Why? Because you don't want to do it. Because you are an intelligent enough person to realize that it's probably bad for you. But there are people who do it. And there are people who, who do it and do it just fine. I guarantee you that every politician, every CEO, every millionaire or billionaire you've ever met has done or is doing cocaine regularly now. Okay? And yes, yeah, sure, a lot of people that are you know, living under bridges and, uh, you know, are uh, homeless and have everything else uh, going wrong for them, uh, do some variation of, the, of, of a drug as well. But I look at it as you need to look at what is the actual um, 
net of making something illegal. When you say a substance is illegal, you are saying that you are not allowed to use your body in an unapproved way, which is to say somebody else has a greater claim to your own body than you do. And I think that's a very dangerous thing to say. And we can see uh, some very concrete examples of, um, you know, for example, prohibition in the United States leading to the rise of uh, violent crime uh, in terms of the organized crime, you know, families and mobs and mafias and things like that. And even after alcohol was made legal, those families are still around, um, except they've moved to other vices. They've moved to cocaine. They've moved to uh, gambling or prostitution or, you know, contract murder or anything else that's illegal. But the, you know, running booze is what gave them the money to start them in the first place. And I think that the same rules apply to people uh, who are producing maybe stronger uh, substances like your cocaine. Now, cocaine used to be in, you know, you used to be able to get cocaine over the counter. Bayer, Bayer aspirin, that Bayer, sold cocaine. It was, a, you know, and they still use cocaine for things like eye surgery. It's a substance. It is not good or bad. But you say, okay, if I am going to be the sort of person who is going to use cocaine or heroin or methamphetamines or any of these other things, do I want that money to go to my local Walgreens and pay for the clerk working there and then filter up into a company who pays its taxes and is not you know, hiring hits on families and you know, mowing down uh, workers with machine guns for not working fast enough? Or do I want somebody who's maybe a little bit more out in the sun being held accountable? Because when you make something illegal, I would say a substance illegal, which I think substances are amoral. Substances don't do anything unless you do something with them. Um, you are making it only uh, supplyable by people who don't care about the law. And I very firmly believe that basically everything should be legal in terms of like substances. And we've got a grand example from Portugal, which is decriminalized all drugs. And they saw drug use fall. They saw drug overdose fall. They saw crime overall fall. And I think that's a great case study. And I just feel like people have been made, they think substances are evil and they're not. It's just, it's silly. It, it's, it's it, everything you can say about cocaine and it's dangerous. You can say about alcohol and it's dangerous. Alcohol it ruins lives. It's a terrible drug. You get hung over, you get addicted to it, you, you crash your car, you, you, know, you run your, your, run your car into a bus full of children, you kill them all, they're all on fire, uh, you get, you know, become alcoholic, you, you live under a bridge, you, you know, you, uh, all, all these horrible things happen. And it's real. It's all real. You can drive in any city, you can see it. It's right there. But alcohol is still legal because we have this very concrete case study. We tried to get rid of it and it made the problem worse. And I don't think that that's any different than what's happening now. So... You own yourself. You get to do with yourself what you want. And when you're trying to fix a problem, make sure that your cure is not worse than the disease you're trying to fix. And I think prohibition is making more problems than it's fixing. But please don't do cocaine. <laughs> please don't do cocaine. Don't take this as a method to go out there and do all the drugs. They're bad for you. They're bad for you. Sugar's bad for you. I have some sugar sometimes. There are certain drugs I have had and I have enjoyed. I don't do them now because it's irresponsible to do so. But it's your body. Yeah, I get it. And I can say that I agree with you so much. And sorry for the noise. I think some something was about to explode in, uh, explode in our flat. I, I mean, some gas is probably <laughs> leaking with the small oh. polish that I can understand. I can hear something that there is a bit of too much, uh, too much leak. So, yeah, you, you mentioned that alcohol is dangerous. I see it in uh, the country I live in Poland that so many people, uh, maybe almost every family has an example of one person who is alcoholic and their lives are lost over alcohol. It is dangerous, but we don't look at it the way we look at, uh, look at, look at, um, cocaine. And actually you said, yeah. don't get, uh, uh, do co cocaine. That's something that I am pretty interested in. And yeah. <laughs> about other drugs, can I go into detail and ask you more? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I have, fairly limited drug experience because they, I've never found them to be particularly interesting uh, for personal usage, but their, uh, you know, recreational usage among other people and sort of the effects that they've had and um, their legal status, I have found interesting. So I'll, I'll do the best I can. Sure. Uh, I, I think that would do. Uh, about psychedelics, have, have you ever done them? And how, if yes, how's the experience been? 
you know, I never have done them, but there's something I have, I have found to be fascinating um, because we have some now very rigorous clinical trials showing that, um, you know, once upon a time they thought this is just something that hippies take and they trip and they think they're, you know, they're in outer space and they're talking to, you know, space demons or whatever. And then, you know, we've got evidence saying, well, actually, you know, people have a single dose of psilocybin mushrooms and they don't have PTSD anymore. You know, they come back from war, you take a mushroom and you're, you're not depressed anymore. Uh, you know, that's really interesting to me. Or um, certain psychedelics helping with uh, you know, degenerative brain disorders like Alzheimer's. Um, there are, you know, trials from, uh, I mean, heck, the, the, the um, tech bros out in San Francisco, they do micro dosing of LSD uh, to help with their creativity and stuff, you know, designing phone apps and, and whatever. And it's like, this is all very interesting because the brain is something that I, I don't care who you talk to. Nobody really understands the brain on a very deep level. It, it's a, it's in a, a complexity that is difficult to even like map out. Like nobody really understands what's going on inside your head. Like here's, here's a question for you. If you know that you know something and you're trying to remember it, what is your brain doing? Like think about that. What is your, what is your, what is your, you're shuffling through your brain going, ah, I remember this, but I can't remember what it was. What on earth is your brain doing? I've never heard a good answer on that. So there, there's mechanics happening in there. But there are all these interesting substances that can manipulate that on a very deep level, and even just with a single dose, change it and fix problems that a lot of people think are chronic. And I think that's fascinating. You know, and there's been such a ban. You know, we go, I think it was 1970, they basically said all psychedelics are illegal. So we've got, we've got what, what, 50 years of research that are totally down the toilet. I think back like 2010, they said, okay, you can start doing some research on it. So it was 40 years of research that we could have had at this point. My dad died of Alzheimer's disease. And I look at these things and I say, what if there was something that somebody could have come up with in 40 years that could have helped them? I think about what, what computers changed in 40 years. What could have happened in, in, in you know, that kind of research in 40 years? An awful lot. That's a lifetime. So I think that they're, they're fascinating. I definitely think they should be legal. I think they should. Uh, given my current uh, status as a father, I'm probably never going to get a chance to try them because, um, you know, I need to maintain a certain level of responsibility. But, yeah, I think they're, they're, they're really interesting. Yeah, I do find them also interesting. So I hope you can hear me well, well in, uh, in the middle of this. I can hear you fine. Yeah. Ah, good. Uh, so uh, do you look at it like uh, alcohol, that it should be legal from a certain age or it should be available to everyone and no regulation whatsoever on it that's a tricky question isn't it i think that um children and well it depends on what you're calling a child um there are children who have no self-agency whatsoever like a child can't necessarily go to the grocery store and buy um you know their own candy they're, they're going to be dependent on their parent to do that up until, you know, a certain age. But there's also this, this age gap where they're not really a child anymore, but they're also not really an adult anymore right? or at this point, right? You're talking to somebody in their, you know, say mid-teens and then that sort of transitional phase. Now, I would say that somebody who would sell a psychoactive substance to somebody like that is being irresponsible. But kids get that stuff anyway you know right now there's i mean is, a, is there a drug problem at high schools yeah there is there's a huge drug problem at high schools um it's not just you know kids smoking weed they're taking pills they're doing uh psychoactive drugs and uh, uh mushrooms and and who knows what else laced with who knows what else and i think if the choice is going to be between that and say a um a product that is backed by a company with a reputation who is going to guarantee that whatever is in that box is what it says on the box. Like this is, a, you know, this is a whatever with this level of strength, this many milligrams, whatever. Um, I think that's a better option. Um, and I think that this is the kind of thing that you need to talk to your kids about. Uh, you know, my, my kid is going to be raised in the idea that you're going to have access to a lot of things that are, that are very, very bad for you. And um, you know, if, to do something, understand it doesn't, or if it's a drug, or if it's anything like that, understand it first. Don't just go diving in head first. I mean, you don't go, you know, just 
jumping off of a building without seeing that there's a safety net, right? You have to understand what, what you're getting into. Um, and if it's something you want to try, do it in a safe place. Do it with people who you feel safe with. Do it with your parents. Who knows? Um, but again, I just feel like if you make it illegal, what you're going to do is you're going to make it uh, taboo. You're going to make it cool. Like, I just look around. We, marijuana is legal here in California. Growing up, there was all this graffiti of marijuana leaves all over everything. People wearing the marijuana shirts and the marijuana leaves painted on buildings. Not there anymore. Why? It's legal. It's not cool anymore. It'd be like drawing a Budweiser logo on a building. It's not cool anymore. So I think taking away the taboo and then also taking away the ability for, say, a um, an officer of the law to harass, say, uh, an underprivileged youth, uh, a minority youth, uh, under the suspicion that they may be using a substance that they have deemed to be so bad, even though, though the officer may have actually been using it themselves relatively recently. Um, I think that, you know, we have to be, be careful again. Is the cure worse than the problem you're trying to solve? And, you know, should you be selling heroin out of vending machines in front of kindergartens? Mm, I wouldn't encourage it, but how would the kid be able to get it anyway without the parent's permission? You, the, the, the parent has to be the, the person there that is, you know, introducing the child to the world and makes them understand. And I think that that's, you know, there's a problem with people, with parents stepping back and not parenting or expecting somebody else to parent for them. I think still say, you know, it should be legal. Yeah. And your age should not determine if something is a crime. I mean, let's, let's put sexual relations aside for this. I'm not talking about that. For, for the, the, who's ever listening is going to say, oh, but what about sex? No, stop it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you put in your body, what your parents uh, protect you from. Um, you shouldn't go to jail for it. Yeah, it makes total sense. And actually, uh, when a company is re responsible for the product that they are making, they are not going to add exactly. some stuff to it that is detrimental, irrespective of the drug. Exactly. It's, it's, you know, you have to be held accountable. I mean, if you look at, uh, do you have ginger ale? And I don't know if it's an American thing. They have ginger ale in, in, uh, in Poland. You familiar with ginger ale? Uh, Beverage? I don't know that. I don't think okay, so it's, they it's, are here. It's, it's, a, it's a soda. Um, and there's a brand called Canada Dry. It's a big brand. And they used to advertise <laughs> made with real ginger on the can. And then they eventually got sued because they were not making it with real ginger. They were making it with ginger extract, which is not considered to be real ginger. And they got sued and they took it off the can because somebody held them accountable. And it's, I mean, that's the stupidest thing in the world. It's, it's such a little thing, but you know what? People are watching and people are making sure that you need to keep your word, even on the, all the little stuff. People are watching. And I just feel like that's, that's better than anything else. You can't even keep drugs out of jails, right? There's literally drug problems in jails. You're surrounded by cops. You're under 24-hour surveillance, and there is still drugs in jail. So it's a problem you can't solve, and I feel like every time you try to solve it, you make it worse. So protect the people who need problems solved, you know, the people who are is substance addicted, uh, you know, the alcoholics, cocaine addicts, heroin addicts, all these people. These are medical problems. And... The rest of it, do with your body what you feel is best. Yeah, it makes total sense to me. And I could say that I agree with every uh, everything you're saying. And there are also questions that I have. The, some of them are kind of solved for me. Some of them are not. And I gather from uh, what you say on Twitter and even your bio that you identify yourself as an anarchist, right? I do. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you det define the pillars of your anarchism and how does it work? <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of I, oxymoron. I, I like, I like there, there's um, what you would call anarchy without hyphens. And this is basically to say that I don't believe in necessarily any particular social organization or any particular uh, economic organization as long as everybody is in agreement and everybody's acting voluntarily. You might call this voluntarism. And, okay, this is an ideal, right? This, this is the way I think the world should be. Will the world ever be like this? No, but it gives me a framework to say what is right and what is wrong. And I think that to have a, a state, I'm not going to say a government, I'm going to say a state, because a state is effectively a, um, 
let's say, a monopoly on the initiation of force. The state is the only body in a society that's allowed to assault somebody who is not being uh, or is not assaulting someone. Right? You don't. You know. You don't. If you don't pay a credit card bill, Visa doesn't come kick your door in and, and, and shoot your dog. But you don't pay your taxes, somebody might. So that's sort of where I sit. I, you, know, you and everybody else around you interact voluntarily. And if it's not voluntary, it's not good. If it is voluntary, it's neutral. I might not like it. I might not like what you're doing. But it doesn't affect me. I don't care. So that's, that's really sort of the base of my, my anarchy. Yeah, and in the example that you provided, that people hold, for example, that soda company accountable, they have to go to the court. Do you think that courts are necessary for a, a society to function? Courts are. There needs to be a way to address grievances. But also understand that most, especially uh, corporate level uh, decisions and, and lawsuits and things like that, are not handled in uh, government run courts. They're handled in arbitration agencies that are completely private. This is already a problem that's been solved voluntarily. And the reason for that is that courts that are run by the federal state governments, at least in the United States, I'm, I'm assuming the same is very true in Europe as well, are, are very expensive and take forever. They're very slow. So when a, uh, you know, an agreement is made or a challenge is made to a, uh, a company or an individual um, or to a contract that was, that was put in place, um, there will, there's often an arbitration agency, a neutral third party, that will basically be brought in to decide who is right. And these people, base, you know, they, they work on reputation. Um, they work on, you know, having the reputation of being neutral and examining the facts against, you know, you know previous cases and, and so forth. And they're very good at what they do, generally. Um, and you know, when they step into the, the arbitration room, or whatever. I've never done it myself, but I've heard of uh, the process going over it. Basically, everybody shakes hands and say, okay, we're leaving, we're gonna present all of our evidence, and we're leaving, we agree at this point to go with the decision of the arbiter. So, I mean, this is a, this is, this is a solution that it already exists, and I just think it should be applied universally. Yeah, uh, I used to be an anarchist, then <clears throat> I, became i mean i saw it as a kind of ideal then mm -hmm. i moved to social democracy as a kind of realistic implementation of government then i snapped out of it and uh, turned back to an, an anarchism pretty much the same way i did before then i snapped out of it welcome back uh... yeah, and then now this time i mean the last couple of months it's been a new change in my way of thinking i would say i'm a free market anarchist and because it, it happened as a result of me going down the rabbit hole of bitcoin and austrian economy uh so that was, i think that's for a lot of people around and i get to be able to say i was right uh, I, i'm kicking myself for not investing more heavily in bitcoin um well i, I discovered bitcoin myself in 2011 and um God, I'd be, I'd be so wealthy right now if, if I just if I didn't listen to any of the haters and doubters. Um, but this is really something interesting. This is this is a whole corrupt government. This is something that could bring, you know, South America, Africa online to be, you know, unleash that economic potential because, you know, I I believe South South Americans and. African people are every bit as smart and hardworking as everybody else on this earth. They just happen to be surrounded by very corrupt governments, and the power dynamic there is immense. You know, you, you talk about the uh, uh, wealth mismatch in the United States. Okay, it's valid. We can call it a problem. Um, I think that's we can debate the causes of that wealth mismatch. But if you talk about something like Ghana, um, you have. I mean, it's it's it's, it's like old feudal states where you have these, these lords, you know, these, these tiny number of people that literally control everything and everybody else is in the dirt. Um, and they're growing and they're doing, they're doing much better now this decade than they were, say, a decade ago. But it's those people, they're literally, like, you can point to, you know, a dozen people and say, those 12 people are the people who are keeping the entire country down. And if you just have a way to step around them entirely, 
you could have, you know, another billion people that are able to produce and, and grow themselves and bring themselves out of poverty and, you know, come into the 21st century with, you know, with everybody else. You know, they're getting cell phones, they're getting the communications technology, and that's step one. And if they can get the money, I mean, we take it for granted here that if I go to the bank, say I've, I've, got, I've got 100 bucks in the bank, I can go to the bank and that 100 bucks is always going to be there. That's not the case everywhere. And people think that, oh, you know, this is some, you know, tech bro, uh, you know, toy, you know, Elon Musk is, uh, he's just having trouble with it. Okay, yes, valid. We've got these get rich quick schemes, you know, when they're manipulating markets, also valid. But that doesn't mean it's not the most powerful tool, in my opinion, to bring the third world, you know, up to speed. Yeah, and, I mean, the hell, you're seeing it, you're seeing it already starting to push like clean energy just because people are like, we need to get some bitcoins and we can't be burning oil to do it. Let's build some more wind farms or whatever uh, and <laughs> start mining. So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's cool to see that happen. And uh, like, I think my biggest regret is not just dumping my entire savings account into it back in 2011 because I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd own an island somewhere. Uh, <laughs> nobody would ever hear from me again. Uh, whatever. Yeah, or, or maybe no, no, nobody would... knows. Or maybe you would be still living in the same place, but you were just using your money to stack more sets. <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. Just yeah, let's, let's go. Let's go from millionaire to billionaire. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. You, the guy with the most money wins. <laughs> Twenty eleven. Oh my God, that's uh, yeah. two or three years after its launch, and yeah, oh it's like, uh, I came out oh nine. So when I my first Bitcoin. And no, don't come after me because they're all, they're almost all gone. I mean, my first Bitcoin I bought for thirty dollars, and then it crashed to a dollar. Right? I was like, oh shit, they were right. And I, then I dumped it all off when it got back up to like seventeen dollars, and I kept a couple. Not even a couple. I kept I kept some. I kept a pittance, and then I just kept <laughs> kind of go up. I was like, oh crap. So then like yeah, so I put a little bit more and a little bit more. But by the time I got to it, it was like it was way more expensive than it, than it made any kind of sense really. Uh, you know, to, to dump into casinos that could just collapse anyway. And I'm pretty conservative about the way I invest my money. I, I work very hard for my money. I don't want it to all just go up in smoke. And there's always that sort of like, I mean, really until relatively recently, it kind of looked like everything could collapse. And you kept having these big resets. Like I remember uh, driving into work one day and I saw Bitcoin was like 17,000. I almost I was like, oh shit, I almost crashed my car. Um, but... And let's just say, I let's just say I was right. <laughs> I was right. I didn't. Uh, I, was, I was right the first time. I was wrong when I listened to the haters, but I was right the first time that this was something that was going to be really special. So, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to, uh, to approach economics. It's also something to help me understand like subjective value and you know why why are things worth anything. I think one of the best questions anybody ever asked me is, is uh, you know, well, nothing backs Bitcoin, and somebody asked, well, what backs gold? And like, you kind of sit back and go, nothing backs gold. Gold is just worth money. And it's like, why? You can't build anything out of gold. It's too soft. You can't build a, you can't build a, you know, if you think about iron, it's way better than gold. You can build buildings out of gold, out of iron. You can make swords and knives out of iron. You can't even make bullets out of gold. It melts. You just get liquid bullets. What, 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 what possible use is gold? Well, it's, you know, it's easily identifiable. It's you know easily transportable. It's uh, it's got uh, it's compact. Uh, it's got all the the things you need if you want to have a verifiable it's means. Of, it's scarce, exactly. All, all the you know there's a, there's a check boxes and you go down them. So okay, the gold does all these things and then Bitcoin does all these things better. And I said, oh, this is neat. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, God, if I had just if I had just <laughs> gone gone all in, uh, I'd I'd be I'd be a happy man. I wouldn't I wouldn't be uh, on my way to work. So. <laughs> Here's what yeah. it is. And when are you leaving for work? What's that? Uh, I'm, in you... the, I'm in the work part. My work, my work doesn't start for another half hour. Uh huh. Okay. So, so yeah. And uh, you telling me your Bitcoin story is a kind of a consolation for me because uh, I got to know it in 2017 or so. And I had a chance mm -hmm. to get one whole Bitcoin and I didn't. And I got some part of it and I spent some of it. Some of it. Mm -hmm. And now I have a very small amount. And if I had the whole. I would have been really, really rich. Yeah. Um, so maybe I read, these, I read these I read these fun stories about people who had like, okay, God, I had a friend of mine who was a major, uh, uh, major geek. Big, he got me into Linux and all that kind of stuff. He was in Bitcoin way back in the day. He was mining it, and he had thousands, and he sold them all. Like when they had a dollar. Um, he had a bunch of Doge coins too. Um, 
And actually, I had a bunch of Dogecoins too. And I think I sold them and they were around a penny. I was like, this is stupid. This is, I'll just trade them for Bitcoins. But then like the whole, you know, <laughs> to the moon happened. I was like, ah, crap. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's taking himself. You know, he's still working. He's like, oh man. I mean, literally, literally like thousands of Bitcoins. He had literally thousands of Bitcoins that he mined himself on his, on his big gaming PC. And yeah, you just go, what if, right? What if? That's deep. That's big, yeah. huge. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to finish with this one topic. Whatever I start and whatever subject I try to dive deep into, I look at it, even if it is not about living things, I look at it through the lens of evolution and I gather from what you're saying that you also look at things through the lens of evolution. And I want to know how central that is and how do you see the world is it set into action by a creator or is it by nature? Or, and how central is it to you in general? Well, my my background, if we take it back a while, is you know I've got 14 years of Catholic school under my belt. Um, I am not I don't identify as Catholic. I identify as an atheist. But I think that we ha we are the result of several billion years of chance and chemical reactions. If there is something greater out there, I think it's beyond our comprehension. Um, I think that it, it's it's arrogant to think that we would be able to understand or even you know, conceive of something that is in control of a universe any more than a snail understands what we are. And so, I don't care. I mean, if there's something out there that actually is that powerful, it could just blink us out of existence, and there's nothing we can do about it. So, I think that analyzing things from what we are able to observe, and from my understanding, what we were able to observe is that life started in a very small place, uh, in a very simple way, and became very complicated over a very, very long period of time, uh, and eventually led to us and we are the the greatest expression of complexity and intelligence that so far we know in the universe and we should use that <laughs> that's kind of a cool tool uh, as far as you know nothing really questions its own existence right um and i, I think that uh, you know we're going to have an uh, an interesting uh, you know million years ahead of us i it, this, it's going to be uh um, it's fun to think about what humanity, you know, is going to be like, you know, in a decade, in a thousand years, in a million years. Um, and, but yeah, I, I definitely do try to take everything that is, at least, you know, as far as in my own life, how I interact with the world, I try to make it as, you know, as close to what I understand I evolved to be in, you know, I evolved to move, you know, I evolved to, you know, probably climb. So I, you know, I do these things that lift weights, I walk. Um, I evolved to eat, you know, to hunt and to gather. Um, so, you know, I, I eat foods that are more consistent with that as, mo as much as I can. Uh, I evolved to rest. I, I evolved to be, you know, in communities and speak with people. Um, so I did do that as much as I can. And, you know, that's overall worked out pretty well for me. So I, I think I'm at least pointed in the right direction if I'm not, you know, all the way there yet. Uh, and how central... Oh, speaking of evolution. Speaking of evolution, let me just point this to you and if everyone else is listening to this. There is a, a fun book called All Tomorrows. Have you read that? No. It's, it's for free. You can find a PDF. It's about 100 pages. It's pretty short. And mm -hmm. it's got a lot of illustrations in it. But the, the concept of the book is um, what humanity turns into over the next billion years as it kind of populates the galaxy and stuff. It's really neat. And it's a really cool art and stuff in it about how like, humans have adapted to different worlds and stuff and dealt with different tragedies and crazy stuff that they've come across. Um, but yeah, all tomorrows. Check that one out. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm sorry, you were saying. Who's the author? <sighs> You're gonna have to look it up. I don't recall off the top of my head. There's mm -hmm. there's the real author, and then there's a there's a pen name that he's he's operating under. But just just Google all tomorrows. Okay. You'll see it. Okay. Yeah, and it's a very unique title. I don't think that anyone else yeah. has used that. I could agree that we are very intelligent. Um, there's no question about that. I once read that if there is any more intelligent creature or a being in the whole world, uh, let them speak for themselves. 
Uh, yep. well, I, I, like I said on Twitter, if somebody got all mad about the farming, where it's like, you know what? Cows had just as much time to domesticate us, and they didn't do it. So sorry, not my fault. Okay, they decided it's more fun to stand around eating grass, and we're like, okay, we're going to build cities. You guys eat your grass, and then we're going to build a fence around you. Now you're stuck. They they could have done that. They chose not to. So I don't have a whole lot of pity for that. But you know, I, just, <laughs> I do have I do have a you know a, a, a strong feeling for animal welfare and stuff like that too. But mm-hmm. you know. We've we've got our uh, we we have utilized our tools to really impressive levels, and uh, I think that we should appreciate what we've been able to achieve with it. Yeah, we sure have. But I also don't deny the fact that I, I mean I believe that any uh, kind of being also, no matter how small, no matter how simple they may seem, they are still complex. For example, there's this kind of wasp that attacks um, caterpillars and uh, paralyzes them and makes it to serve its own purpose and it just paralyzes it, doesn't kill it. So the meat is preserved fresh and it lays in its eggs inside so that the, yeah. the offsprings can eat fresh meat all the time. And yeah, that's... yeah. No, there's, some, there's some wild stuff out there in nature. Wow. Uh, you know, there's, there's like the cordyceps mushrooms that infect bugs and make them co- crawl to the top of grass yeah. as the birds come and eat them and then complete the cycle and everything else yeah. again. You go, oh my God, this is wild stuff. This is like real stuff. And then you wonder like, is something doing that to me right now? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I read these stories about, um, there was, a uh, what's the stuff? Uh, toxoplasmosis, um, from, uh, cat feces that makes people weird. And oh. that, that maybe the explanation for why. Egyptians worshipped cats <laughs> because they're all basically hypnotized by this uh, this amoeba thing that lives in cat shit. And I was like, wow. oh my god, would that be so wild? Uh, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's fun to think about. And yeah, you're absolutely right. There's uh, there's there's amazing stuff on this planet. There really, really is cool stuff. And I do have a great respect uh, for life. You know, I, even though I laugh about the animal domestication and stuff, I am a big proponent of not introducing more suffering into the world. I think that there are, there are uh, ways to raise animals as food, as livestock, um, that doesn't make them suffer because nature will introduce suffering to them. You know, you don't die a good death as a, ca- a cow or a deer or a sheep in nature. You know, something, something you know, tears your throat out and you bleed to death is, is generally how that's going to happen in nature. And, you know, maybe, maybe it's the bolt gun is not a blessing, but it's a lot better than most things on this earth get, right? And, you know, domesticated animals, they get medical care. They get, they, they are not going to starve to death. They are not going to be victims of predators. They are not going to, um, you know, suffer a, a broken leg and to starve, which, you know, not, not everything on this earth is that lucky. So I think that, that treating animals well, even if they're domesticated, is important. Probably makes them taste better too. So, yeah. And uh, when, uh... You know, those examples of mistreated animals, they really agree that it is kind of mistreatment, maltreatment. We shouldn't treat them like that. They are not the norm. For example, I am on a train here going to another city and I see cows running around eating grass. And that's something that I see very, very frequently here. It is not that they are in a very narrow space, in a narrow cage and not having access to anything and well life it's life and we yeah. have happened to evolve in a way that we eat them yeah well a lot of people don't realize also is that um it's expensive to do to raise animals poorly because they get sick and you can't sell diseased meat at a market uh and you know, unless oh, maybe we probably can get away with it in you know some, like rural China or something, but you know if it's in the United States or something or any place with any kind of um, any kind of oversight or anybody who cares about the quality of the product, I mean, is any kind of economic development where they'd be able to say I don't want that? Um, it's very expensive to do that. Just to have to constantly you know get these chemicals and these treatments and everything to keep the animals just from dying. Um, it's it's expensive to do that, so it's actually it, it ends up being uh, more uh, cost effective to have a healthy, happy stock uh, of most animals than uh, than to not. I always thought that kind of interesting. And what kind of raising animal do you see the most beneficial and most ethical? Um, you know, I'm a big fan of cows. 
Cows are interesting. Um, I've read a lot about cows, and I think that this may be just a um, an effect of being an American because we don't eat grazing animals or cows around here. Um, but you know, there's uh, Nicolette Neiman's great book, Defending Beef, uh, where she talks about the regenerative nature of uh, uh, of grazing cattle and the fact that you know most cattle are grazed for most of their life. Uh, and how, you know, you know, the, the grazing land with the deeper roots, it preserves, you know, water, it prevents landslides. Um, the uh, mycology and the, the, the um, um, fungal spores and stuff in, inside the soil allow this communication between plants and the sharing of nutrients that doesn't exist in monocropping. Um, and, you know, it seems like there's, there are ways to raise cattle um, that is a net benefit to the land. You know, there's, there's what uh, Neem is doing. There's what the, uh, Alan Savory is doing. Um, there's uh, the other guy. Uh, His first name is Joel, I guess. Joel Salatin. Yeah. Joel Salatin. Yeah. Joel, Sal- yeah, Joel Salatin. What these guys are doing, and, and you can you can see, you know, there's there's data. You know, they can see there's more topsoil. There's less water runoff. There is, you know, you can put up air quality monitors, and the air quality above their farm is better because of sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, you know, most of the carbon that goes into a plant goes into its roots. If it's, you know, if it's a if it's a perennial plant, right? So, I just found that to be very interesting. I think that it would probably be beneficial to have maybe more biodiversity um, in the United States. Like, we don't do a whole lot of sheep or goats or anything here. Um, we do some, not much. Um, you know, most of the goat and sheep stuff here is mainly for like um, cheeses and dairy, and. I don't. I like lamb chops. I like to see <laughs> maybe maybe uh, there's there's certain benefits, maybe certain terrains that um, sheep can uh, flourish on that cows can't for whatever reason. I don't know. I'm not an expert on this. I do recall actually. Let me take the back. There was a um, there was a vineyard in Napa or Sonoma County or somewhere up north of here that um, had a bunch of grapevines, and what they effectively did is they took out a third of the grapevines and spaced out all the grapevines. And then grew grass between them and had uh, goats run around, goats or sheep, one of them, run around, and they're eating the grass and, you know, pooping and everything else, and that's fertilizing the grapes. And I think they had a couple other plants that they were in rotation there, some kind of fruiting trees and stuff around the outside of it. And they were able to get more money per acre of land than just growing grapes for the wine. Because they get the wine grapes, and then they get the, the meat and the dairy and the fruit on the same acre of land and it's like maybe you get a, a third less of each but you got four times as much so it, it, the, the math works out and you say oh that's really interesting huh and you know, we, need, we need smart people trying these experiments and seeing what happens and uh, I'm just glad to see there's people out there doing it but yeah, all I really know is cows because this is what we have in America yeah and uh, it's pretty cool that it is also from a financial point of view when you weigh down, uh, weigh things against each other, you see that it is more. Uh, it brings you more profit, and that's amazing. Yeah. It, it, it's it has incentive that's in that's it. That's the thing. That's the thing is that most of the time, if we talk about waste, we talk about um, you know they say oh if you have a free market or capitalist system or whatever, it generates a lot of waste. And I said, what is waste? Waste is things that are left over after you put stuff in and get out what you wanted, and you have to throw something away. You want to minimize that. Because everything that you waste is money lost, right? Which is why in a cow there's no waste. Like you get your leather, and you got your, you know, you get gelatin from the uh, the bones and the and the hooves, and you get the, um, you know, everything the cow goes into making something from 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 you know, there's wood polishes and um, finishing. They used to use pork fat to make bombs in World War II. I mean, it, it all goes into something because they figured out that we've got these things, and everything we have to throw away is just money right down the toilet. So how do we make more money at it? You know, there's companies making, uh, um, they're called garbage oil, we, you, where they take back, you know, uh, naturally occurring bacterial strains that break down garbage and actually turn it into a petroleum-like product that can be refined and, and, and burned as fuel to power the plant that's doing this while having a surplus that they can sell off to, you know, the, the highest bidder. It's so literally just taking money and... It's like, well, that's pretty sustainable, right? I mean, this is, you want to talk about sustainability. This is just somebody figuring out how to make money out of, out of garbage. It's, you know, if smart people do their jobs, they come up with some really clever shit. I'm big fan of stepping out of the way. Let smart people work, let them do the job, and they come up with, with, with really smart stuff. 
as long as they're held accountable for their actions if they if they make stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually one of uh, it's also one of my dreams to uh, if Bitcoin raises to a uh, good price and I have a solid kind of backing, I want to start my own farm in one of the countries that are good for growing and do this kind yeah. of regenerative stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And me so, too. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's a kind of dream. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I said if Bitcoin goes up, I am kind of maximalist on it. And I don't like to use the word if I should, I should say when. I'm more inclined to say yeah. when. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's what I tell my wife. I tell my wife, says, don't worry. You know, we'll, we'll, sell off a, we'll sell off our Bitcoin when it hits a couple million dollars each. And she's like, it's not going to hit. I'm like, you said that about 10,000. You said about 50,000. You know, it's just, it, just give it time. All it is is time. Yeah. Don't worry. We'll sell, off, we'll, sell, we'll sell off what we got. We'll buy a mansion, <clears throat> put the kid through college, call it a day. Yeah. Oh, that, day is, that day comes. So uh, I know that's it's coming. Pretty patient. Pardon? So it's coming. You just got to be patient. Yeah. 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 Maybe for years, but it's going to pay off. <laughs> I mean, I have seen it growing from 100 to 3,000, and it's a funny story. I was in the middle of our economy class, and our teacher said that. It was almost four or five months after I had gotten to know Bitcoin. And our teacher said that, for example, Bitcoin has reached this price. And I said, yeah, but what? I do have Bitcoin. And I wasn't even tracking. And I saw it getting to 9,000, 3,000. And yeah, it's just a matter of time. It will go up and it's going to be more precious. And so many, like tragedies to befall it that i feel like if it was going to implode it would have done it by now and now it's just kind of it's, it, it, there's too many it's too widespread it's too big there's too many different you know it, it's all over the globe it's not like it's a couple of tech centers in, in you know california or whatever um they're mainly churning it out or like you know one big place in china churning it out it's all over the place it's too dispersed it's like i don't know trying to shut down the, the global electrical grid it's just not going to happen and it, I think that's really cool. <laughs> so you can't stop it. And oh, there's a great video of um, who was it? Uh, Friedrich Hayek. He was talking mm -hmm. about uh, how how bad the money was getting. This is I think back to like 1970. And he's like, we're never going to get it back. So what we somebody needs to come up with some clever way to just sneak their own money in without the government noticing. And it's like, ah, they did it. They did it. It happened. He was right again. Uh, it's fun. Yeah, it is. but I'm I, I'm a very hopeful person. I think we're still very very early in a lot of ways. Yeah, we're very are. early in terms of talking about you know everybody getting healthy. It's very early talking about uh, you know sound money. It's very early talking about you know everything. So yeah, great. So I I know that you I want to be respectful of your time. I know that you're going to head work and uh, oh man, you're an early bird. You were awake at seven a.m. Well, I, I wake up at about five to get to work on time, so. Oh, great. So thank you for your time. It's been a great chat and we see eye to eye on so many topics. Hope to see you yeah. one time in real life. That would be fun. Yeah, sure thing. Like I said, I'm in Europe every so often for uh, for business. If you're ever on the mainland or whatever, uh, uh, give me a holler. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Thank but you. I think it's a bit of a drive here, but all right. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Have a great day. <laughs> you too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal or Bitcoin.